Hello, my name is Casey uh, Rosenthal. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about chaos engineering. Chaos engineering, yay. So this is a very timely talk. Uh, we just had the first uh, chaos community day uh, where people from um, kind of the usual suspects in the industry, uh, Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, we all uh, came together for a full day workshop in San Francisco and uh, compared notes on chaos engineering, what it is, and uh, we're working to develop uh, best practices around this. So I'm hoping that you'll leave this presentation with a good understanding of what chaos engineering is and why it's necessary and why it's necessary, why it's emerging now as a new uh, discipline within software engineering. So I work at a company called Netflix. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's kind of like Blockbuster, but online. <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody to say, what's Blockbuster? It's kind of like Uber for video. Um, so, and, and it's big, it's very, it's, uh, it's, it's very large. Our scale is very large. So we're about 40% of 40% of internet traffic at peak. Um, which turns out is a lot. Uh, we, we have the world's largest CDN uh, several times over. And uh, we control that CDN, we control access to the video uh, with our uh, control plane, which runs in the cloud, specifically on AWS. And we run that uh, in three regions, so that's the software that uh, if you happen to use Netflix when you connect to the service and choose a video and DRM and all of that stuff, that all happens in the cloud. Uh, I manage uh, two teams that are pertinent to this talk. One is the, the traffic team, which controls where uh, the client devices hit the cloud, and the chaos team, which is related to chaos engineering. So uh, I'll briefly talk about Netflix's architecture uh, because I'll be using it as an example. We have what, what uh, the industry calls a microservice architecture. And here's an overly simplistic uh, representation, but here are seven services. And a service might uh, look like um, a login service or a search service. So these are isolated components uh, that you can hit uh, in the stack. And up top is a Netflix device, a television, mobile device. Uh, PlayStation, something like that. And when that device wants to um, retrieve a movie or interact with our service, it sends a request down to a specific service, say uh, login. And then that service will fan out the request. So it'll make requests to, in this case, C and F, and then C makes requests to A, and F makes requests to B and G, and A makes requests to B, and G makes requests to B and E, and so on. Uh, we actually have over 300 microservices. So you can see that green layer, that spaghetti layer, gets pretty complicated. And then uh, when the services all finish communicating with each other, uh, eventually D uh, returns the request to the device. And while this isn't the only way that, um, that software at scale can be built, we do see uh, a general trend towards uh, what we call decentralized development. So again, a microservice architecture is just one example of decentralized development. And you can see this in uh, loosely coupled asynchronous development models. It doesn't have to be microservices. It could be a, a monolithic application. Uh, actor models, I know that was a contentious uh, topic in one of the previous talks. Um, distributed development teams. So you've got engineering teams that are now spread out. Uh, basically, we're, we're kind of on the elbow of an exponential increase in the complexity of software engineering. And I'm not going to dwell on that too much because I haven't found that to be contentious. I don't know too many people who disagree with me. Uh, but if you look at um, everything from data storage to how we uh, deliver applications to what they're actually doing, they're getting much more complex. And when you combine that, you get this kind of exponential effect. So for example, more uh, data will be stored in 2015 than in 2014 and all prior years in human history combined. Uh, that's an inflection point. You combine that with uh, the movement towards containers, uh, 
uh, infrastructure as a service, platforms as a service, uh, you know, these are components that as software engineers we don't even necessarily um, have to interact with because we, we can't. And in order to get our jobs done, um, we have to rely on these components that we can't introspect. So I'll, I'll bring up, uh, I'll dive into one example in particular, um, artificially incomprehensible algorithms. Um, you might know it by the, the, uh, the term AI algorithms. So artificially incomprehensible algorithms can't be introspected. So if you think of like a neural network, uh, if you want to know how it works, basically you can't. Some people call it a black box, but if you open it up, you, you'll, you, can, you can see integers, numbers, weights, um, but it's going to be meaningless for you as a software engineer. You can't possibly hold all of those integers in your head and, and map um, a, a neural network of any note uh, to be able to predict what it's going to come up with as output. It's a lot of complexity, but the classical approach to software engineering uh, doesn't take this into account. So the software approach to uh, the classical approach to software engineering is okay. You've, you're going to have some um, input, a function that'll either modify state or modify that input or, or do something, and then it'll have some predictable output. More sophisticated software is just a composition of units like that. And this is very convenient for testing because when you're testing something in the classical model, you can just say, all right, for this code, under these conditions, under conditions X, Y will happen. And you make that assertion. And then you can have confidence in your code by running a test suite and making sure that those assertions hold. But with an artificially incomprehensible algorithm, you can't do that because you don't know what Y is. So uh, that's the classical approach. What else can we say about decentralized development? Well, focus on this guy for a second. <laughs> Architects. Um, I'm not going to pull to see how many people here have the, the word architect in their title, um, because I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But in decentralized development, the role of the architect is diminished, and in some cases, disappears entirely. So the architect is the person who uh, can not just plan out an entire architecture, but when you want to develop a new feature, you, know, you can go to the architect and sort of get their blessing because they have the mental model of how all of the pieces fit together. And so they're the person who can give a sanity check to an engineering design. But where we are in, in the, the march towards complexity in software engineering, our projects are moving to a place where no human can mentally model all of the pieces. So this role becomes less important. In the case of a complicated microservice architecture, we don't have architects. We don't have uh, people who can tell us, yes, all of these, these pieces are going to work well together. Um, which leaves us with less confidence. Now we make this trade-off explicitly because what a microservice architecture gives us is faster development, so more velocity, and more flexibility. Because each of those microservices is owned by a very small engineering team. And they can push uh, changes to their microservice at any given time. We have several hundred uh, pushes to production uh, a day, if not in some cases uh, in, in over the span of an hour. And all of those engineering teams are making changes to their own code base. They communicate with other teams, but there's nobody who sits in that green layer and makes sure that all of the pieces communicate together in some organized fashion. Instead, we get something closer to uh, emergent behavior. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into uh, this form of complexity specifically uh, systemic complexity. And it's, it, it is a little bit early, but um, uh, when we talk about this emergent behavior happening, uh, sort of being led by an invisible hand, um, well, let me just dive into it. So it's, it's a little bit early, but let's talk about beer. Um, I'm going to take you through, I imagine there, there's probably some MBAs in the room. If any of you are, are thinking about, so for those of you who have an MBA, you might have seen this before. Um, uh, 
uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to walk you through the beer game. For those of you who want to get an MBA, I'm going to ruin a semester for you. So don't bother taking the, the systems thinking uh, class. So we're going to play the beer game. Or rather, I'm going to take you through um, a hypothetical playing of, of the beer game. And the beer game has three teams, all focused around beer. One team, customers, they like to drink beer. Another team, retailers, they sell it. And a third team, manufacturers, microbreweries, they make the beer. And typically what happens in an MBA class is the class is divided into th these three teams, and they're moved into separate rooms. And they can only communicate to each other by passing slips of paper back and forth that indicate uh, intent to buy or money or goods uh, transferred. Okay, so in, in our example, um, We'll assume that this beer is a, is a relatively um, unknown microbrewery. We'll call it um, Kansas City IPA, KC IPA. So uh, it, there's, a, there's a baseline, there's a steady state, and you don't have to pay too much attention to the numbers. I'll run through them quickly. But for uh, any given week uh, on uh, your left, uh, the customer demand might be for one case of beer. So they purchase one, the retailer has two in stock, so after that one is, is purchased, they have one left. And then the retailer orders one from the manufacturer who has eight in stock, and they're bottling one. So consider this week zero, right? And we have steady state because the customer demand is one and the manufacturer is making one case. But then one week, um, John Daly, who's sitting up here in the front, I told you that was a dangerous place to sit, He's an astute and very thorough uh, connoisseur of microbrewers. And uh, he digs up KC IPA because, you know, World Series and all that. And he orders three cases. So demand goes up to four. He can only purchase two, actually, because the retailer only had two. So there's this uh, negative left of, negative, of uh, two, this demand that's unmet. Uh, but the retailer goes ahead and orders four to keep up stay ahead of it. The manufacturer has eight, so they start manufacturing five again to keep up. And John likes it so much that not only does he drink uh, the, the case that he has, but he tells his friends about it. And John has a lot of friends. So the next week, his friends go, oh, you know, again, the Royals won the World Series. What could be more um, uh, patriotic and loyal to our, to our team than uh, ordering some uh, KC IPA. So the demand shoots up to 16. They can only purchase four because the retailer only had four, so there's missing demand. The retailer orders 20 cases to get ahead of it, and the manufacturer starts bottling 40. Um, the Royals then actually win the World Series. So of course, demand skyrockets, skyrockets to 64. They can only purchase eight, so there's some missing demand. Uh, the retailer orders 70, and the manufacturer wants to stay ahead of this, so they build a second microbrewery and start bottling 250 cases. Okay, the next week, um, demand wanes a little bit because nobody can get their hands on this. They actually can't order any that week because there isn't any available, so there's a big uh, missing uh, uh, profit there. And the manufacturer can't serve any because they just brought this new microbrewery online. An interesting thing happens that weekend. Um, somebody's interviewing uh, Wade Allen Davis and asks them, oh, do you like this uh, KC IPA? And he actually let slip that it's terrible. Turns out putting the blue dye in the beer like made it really skunky. And the next week, the only people who want to order it are um, John to, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, dry his tears with. And, uh, but he still can't uh, because there isn't any there. Uh, but the week after, we go back to steady state. Now the manufacturer is ready. So the retailer now has 70 cases sitting on their shelves and we end up with this result. The retailer has 70 cases that they're never going to sell. They missed uh, consumer demand of 125 cases. The manufacturer has 180 cases that they're not going to be able to offload. And an extra factory, WTF, are they going to do with that? Now, the point of this game was to optimize for customer satisfaction and profit. And we ended up with a pretty terrible result. And I don't want to leave you um, staring at a terrible result. So. Um, <laughs> What's the point of this game? The point of this game isn't to prove that students are stupid. Actually, the opposite. 
uh, the people playing this game are just presumably very intelligent. In fact, they made uh, the correct decision given the information that they had at every step of the game. And yet, we ended up with a really terrible result. The engineers, there's a direct analog here, the engineers who write the microservices might be making those services 100% correct, provably correct, full test suites, exactly to spec, and yet the systemic effect of those services interacting with each other could lead to bad results. And we don't have an architect to turn to to give us confidence that all of these pieces fit together and, and work in a way that does what we want. So chaos engineering tackles that, that green layer. Uh, about three years ago, we released uh, an open source uh, package and blogged about it a lot called Chaos Monkey. Some of you might have heard of it. Uh, again, our traffic control plane running in the cloud um, has this feature where virtual machines can spontaneously disappear. And when you're running at a large enough scale, that's kind of a guarantee uh, when, when you're deployed in, in the cloud. Sometimes VMs will just vanish. It turns out it's inconvenient when it happens at 3 a.m. Um, and that's the time that all VMs usually uh, vanish, is sometime really early in the morning. And our engineers are all on call for their own services, so getting those calls is, is kind of a disruption. So we decided, hey, wouldn't it be great if those VMs vanished during business hours instead? And so that's what we created. Chaos Monkey will take pseudo randomly, take virtual machines in our platform and kill them conveniently during business hours. And this had a great effect on the, the availability of our service because it aligned all of our engineers to build their services in such a way that they can withstand, they're, they're resilient to this, they can withstand a server just disappearing and it'll continue to run. That was really successful for us and in, in fact we haven't had an impact on availability or uh, resiliency or performance due to Chaos Monkey for like two years. So we thought, huh, turns out breaking stuff in production has some value. What else can we do with this? So we created Chaos Kong, <laughs> which is on the other side of the spectrum. So Chaos Monkey turns off servers. Chaos Kong turns off regions <laughs> or, or data centers if you're not in the cloud. Groups of data centers, actually. So um, now, uh, interestingly enough, Amazon hasn't actually given us a switch to turn off a, a region. Something about other customers are also there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we have to simulate this, but uh, we simulate a region going down and moving all of the traffic uh, elsewhere in the globe. Amazon loves it when we do that, by the way. <laughs> uh, the phone calls we get are really interesting. Um, so this was also uh, great in aligning our engineers to build their, their uh, services in a way that's uh, resilient to a regional failure. And in fact, we do this regularly now, where we'll shut down a region and route traffic uh, around it. And there have been a couple cases um, recently where we've had to use this in production, where Amazon has, AWS has run into an issue, and uh, we would have to evacuate a region and move traffic uh, elsewhere to keep this, the service up. So we thought, okay, so we've got Chaos Monkey on one end of the spectrum and Chaos Kong on the other, and really what we're looking for is um, confidence in the system as a whole. So how do we distill this into a formal method or a fundamental practice that allows us to take that practice and move forward so that we can have, uh, have this confidence that we're looking for? Um, so we actually did sit down and around a table and think hard about it. And what we came up with is uh, our description of uh, the discipline of chaos engineering. So here's our uh, elevator pitch. Chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence 
in that system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. Now, uh, an audience like this, you're probably aware that um, the only conditions in production are turbulent ones. So that combined with this, uh, system, this uh, systems architecture that we have, this, this decentralized development that we have, how can we build confidence that this has the availability and the other attributes that we want? So we run chaos engineering as a series of experiments now where uh, we'll pick some metric of interest. For Netflix, it's easy. It's uh, how many people a second uh, start playing a video. That's a, a fairly um, consistent business metric for us. It's an, it's an easy one for us to look at. And we say, OK, we kind of, we, that's, that's pretty smooth through time. We know what steady state looks like for that. So uh, we create a hypothesis that that steady state will remain steady even in the face of one of these turbulent conditions. And we construct an experiment where we take some production traffic, we run some of it through a control group and some of it through a variable group. In the variable group, we introduce a turbulent condition, like servers going off or uh, latency uh, rising or something like that. And then we look to, to see that uh, the, the stream starts per second remains steady. And if they track together, if they do, then we have more confidence that the system can withstand that condition. If they deviate, then our hypothesis is disproved and we have um, something to investigate and figure out why uh, the system broke down there. Taking that a little bit further, um, we created some advanced uh, principles. The first, uh, so the advanced principles are like our gold bar for chaos engineering. The first is to build a hypothesis about steady state behavior. As engineers, we often have a temptation to dive in and want to figure out how a, how a model works, how a system works. Uh, but an investigation is, a, is an allocation of resources. And so we're explicitly saying chaos engineering is not trying to figure out how the model works. We just want to validate, we just want to verify that the model does work. So to help us do that as engineers, we focus on um, a hypothesis on steady state behavior, not on algorithmic correctness or, um, or a non-steady state metric, something that's, that's internal to how the system operates. The second advanced uh, principle is very real world events. So again, in a classical model, you would make sure that this engine uh, performs exactly uh, properly, uh, which I'm sure it does. However, that doesn't matter if you run into a giant pothole. The, the variables in the experiment have to be real world effects. Again, uh, so stuff disappearing, um, latency introduced, packets lost, uh, errors being returned. I uh, kid you not, people shooting at power lines and hitting uh, trans uh, internet transmission cables uh, out a little bit further west of here. Um, and sometimes not bad things, right? So like a, a big uh, uh, increase in customer demand. That's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's not a failure, uh, but it's certainly a condition that you'd want to test for. Experiment in production. So we're, we're already making an assumption that we can't have an architect who can mentally model the entire system. Likewise, you can't project onto your testing or QA people that, uh, or even the, the engineers who are building the spec, that they can mentally model all of the ways that uh, a consumer of the service will use it. So the only way to verify that you're actually building confidence in the system you have is to test that exact system which means you have to experiment in production. Customers will use the service in ways that you don't expect. Your environments in production and testing will be different. In our case, we're pushing to production hundreds of times a day. So if we're testing a synthetic system, we're testing the system that we don't have because it's not going to have the same. Uh, there's, there's, there's no scheduling mechanism for us to verify that the current production set uh, matches the, the testing environment. And finally, automate your experiments to run continuously. This is kind of just a reminder to automate, but we found that our chaos engineers can't keep up, again, with all of those pushes to production in a given day. Uh, we can't manually build
build the confidence that we want in a system, we have to automate it. So those are the advanced principles of uh, chaos engineering. Build a hypothesis about steady state behavior, very real world events, experiment in production, and automate your experiments to run continuously. So that's one way to build um, confidence in um, a decentralized uh, developed system, or in, in our case specifically, a microservice uh, system. So I went through that a little bit quickly because I wanted to give you a preview of um, a different discipline, another emerging discipline that's also focused on uh, the complexity in these distributed systems. And we call that intuition engineering. And I'll show you a specific example, an application that my team wrote called Flux. So again, you have this complex distributed system. And in this case, I wanted the team to develop a tool that would give us a, a holistic sense of this complexity. I wanted, and I, <laughs> I think I actually use these words, I, I wanted the team to build a tool that would give me a visceral feel of the state of the system. And they kind of just looked at me. So it took a while for me to find a metaphor that resonated. It's an absurd metaphor, but here it goes. Imagine we build a suit, and the suit is covered in electrodes. And the electrodes correspond to different microservices. And when you're on call, you get to wear the suit. We affectionately call this the pain suit. <laughs> so 3 o'clock in the morning, you wake up, ah, oh, my shoulder hurt, ah, oh, the login is down again. God. Um, <laughs> After wearing this suit for not too long of a time, you would essentially develop a new sense. You would just feel the state of the system, right? So you start feeling a little bit queasy or a little bit off. You're like, ah, you know what? I need to go um, look at some metrics and graphs because something's wrong with the system. I just kind of like intuitively know it and now I have to go figure out why. Um, for whatever reason, my team didn't want me to actually build a pain suit, so we haven't done that yet. But we tried to find a visual analog. So I'll give you an example. Here's an example of Flux, which are, is our vis visual analog for that uh, at, at the highest level. So let me tell you what you're looking at here. So uh, ignore the numbers. Um, because I made those up for this uh, presentation, but uh, this is a, a video from the actual tool aside from the numbers. What you see in the center is the internet. The three corners are regions in AWS. So upper left is uh, US West, then U, uh, US East, and then EU West. Those dots are requests coming into our control plane from the internet. So after looking at this for not too very long, your brain will automatically figure out um, essentially the volume of dots and what normal looks like. And the color, blue generally means the request was good. Uh, you'll see a couple red dots in there. Those are errors. And orange ones, if you can make them out on that screen, are fallbacks. So they're requests that were OK, but they trigger to fall back within our system your brain will naturally figure out uh, generally the relative speed of the dots, which reflects latency. So in this one uh, view, again, after looking at it for just a few minutes, uh, you can just glance at it and, yep, everything looks fine. You develop an intuition for the state of our entire control plane that you can access in just a glance. So this is what we mean by intuition engineering. It's building an interface that allows us to develop an intuition for these very complex systems. If you click on one of those regions, I'll just take you one layer in. Here's a deeper view. 
of uh, US West, I hid the labels to the, to the circles because the, the names of the microservices wouldn't mean anything to you. But the circle, circles are microservices. In the upper left, you see traffic coming in from the internet. And you can see how the request pattern is actually fanning out through our microservice architecture. Now, we pruned the tree so that there's um, a number of microservices here that you can visually take in. Again, we have uh, many hundreds, but a lot of those aren't important for the critical path. So this is basically the critical path for customers uh, navigating the site and finding and playing a movie. And in this example, um, most of those dots are blue. But uh, again, if one of the microservices is returning errors or behaving wonky, uh, after looking at this for not too long, your eye will just kind of focus in on, oh, something weird is happening down there. I should go alert that team or look into it. And in fact, while this was still in beta, we found a couple issues in production just by having this up and running while we were developing it. I mentioned one of my teams uh, is the traffic team, which controls moving um, traffic around the globe in, uh, in the case of a regional failure. Here's uh, a time-shortened example of that actually happening. So again, here's the regional view in the upper uh, left is US West. And you can see over time, the error rate in US West is going up. So maybe we push some code there that's doing something wonky. So at some point, um, we get a little bit alarmed that it's reaching, you know, it's over 11% uh, error rate. And you can see along the top, we're now proxying those requests to uh, the East Coast. So uh, we have to wait for the East Coast to scale up to handle this uh, new traffic. So that takes a little bit of time. Uh, but at some point, we go ahead and flip DNS. And then the requests are just going directly to the East Coast. And now US East is taking all of the traffic that uh, it was taking previously, plus US West. We can then go in and fix whatever was happening in US West, or we could hold this position in, until we fixed it. And once it's fixed, we essentially reverse the process. We uh, continue to proxy traffic over, uh, but we flip DNS back. And then uh, once um, US West scales back up, we can go ahead and return it to the state that it was in. Uh, it would take about 19 um, charts uh, to view the same amount of information. And then we'd have to be tracking charts, which are a pain. Uh, plus the, the numbers that they were uh, showing us, to be able to understand what you all now can just intuitively get by just looking at this. So we found this tool um, has actually been very, very useful for us. So again, that tool um, called Flux, example of intuition engineering. Uh, my team, I just want to... Uh, Shout out to my team. So those are the guys who are doing the, the actual work. If any of you want to uh, get in contact with any of them or harass them, I can totally put you in touch with them. And hopefully, I have some time left for questions on either chaos engineering or intuition engineering. Questions? No. No questions. Awesome, then I guess it's lunchtime. I've got a question. <laughs> so my question is about what do you consider acceptable for data loss? Now, for many of us in this room, we work in the healthcare industry. Um, and m my question to you, I suppose, is if we're able to take services down in production, uh, is it acceptable to be losing data potentially? So I would say that no, in the case where um, lives depend on the data, it's absolutely not acceptable to lose any of it. Um, that said, that I believe puts more uh, um, importance on running experiments like these in production. Because if you think your database is never gonna go down, then you're lying to yourself. 
uh, you have to architect your system so that a database can go down and you still won't lose any data. And whether that means simply using an eventually consistent system or um, ha having a more difficult but uh, equally robust, strongly consistent system is a separate question. But absolutely, your data store for healthcare should be able to tolerate uh, servers, uh, data storage servers going down and coming down uh, regularly in production. And the, the only way to, to make sure that it, is, that it can handle that is to try it. And you, you know, again, if lives are on the, on the line, you certainly want to do that in a controlled manner rather than waiting for it to happen randomly. So I would argue that chaos engineering is particularly important in um, uh, life critical cases. Maybe a little bit less so in financial ones, but. Uh, question for you. So did you have, uh, like the, so you mentioned architects and um, kind of this view that I know how the whole system is composed together. Um, did you have that before and the migration from kind of a traditional architect role to this, you know, chaotic view of there is no architect. Maybe just talk about the transition process, if you had that. Sure. Um, so I can't say too much about it because a lot of it happened before my time at Netflix, but we did used to have like eh, seven or eight years ago, a monolithic application living in a data center. And we explicitly decided we want to move faster and we want more flexibility to create features. And so that's why we broke our engineering out over time into microservice, architect, uh, microservice architecture. Um, it didn't require a lot of selling at Netflix. I understand that other organizations, some of them have a more difficult time selling that. Um, but yeah, at this point, we, we don't really have, some people have the architect in their title, but we don't really have an architect, certainly not a chief architect, at Netflix. Uh, the engineering teams build their own services and manage that, and everything just kind of sort of works. Hi, thanks uh, for talking here. It's really awesome. We're a startup. We've got three developers and like 50,000 users and uh, eight microservices at this point, basically following your blog for every uh, piece of advice on how to do everything. Cool. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about so right now, we all sort of have the whole mental model. And with we all being three people, it's like, fine. I wonder if you could talk about a technique for sort of transitioning to not knowing what's going on and trusting in the green layer. Do you know what I mean? Or sure. Any, maybe just, so yeah. I'm sure you know exactly when your service is going to take off and hit scale right before then. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know what that means in, in your business context. 50,000 users, you know, you're, you're, you have time to um, get solid footing. Um, it, it, you know, this, like many systems, uh, chaos engineering uh, is easier if it's in place right before you need it. Um, in, in our case, that wasn't the case. We, we, implement, we are still implementing it after the fact. Um, but on the flip side, it's easier for us to demonstrate ROI because it's like, oh, we had this outage. Now we have chaos engineering and no longer have those outages. See how wonderful chaos engineering is? Um, but that takes some, some arguing to get the, or to get the well, and some persuasion to get the engineers aligned towards what chaos engineering gives you. If you have chaos engineering from the get-go, then it's easier to just keep carrying along, but you also won't be able to point to what your service would look like without it. Um, so I don't think I really have any useful advice there, but good luck. <laughs> Is there anyone using this in, a, uh, in engineering teams that are not web-based, like distributing a game or some type of you know, software that's you know, run on computers that you don't control? Uh, so Netflix runs on uh, over 2,000 devices. Uh, and most of our traffic is not web-based. So uh, chaos engineering, yes, absolutely. There was another, yep. Uh, can you give me some examples of the different services that you would split out into, into 
into the, micro, the different microservices that you have? Uh, entirely depends on your business context. For us, I can give you examples like um, identity management, right? We call our users subscribers. So subscriber has its own service. Um, search is its own service, right? If search goes down, we don't want the, the, the application to stop working, right? So the, you know, there's going to be fallbacks in there and stuff so that people should still be able to look at their list of movies and play stuff. Um, that's kind of a non-critical service. Uh, we have a lot of personalization algorithm teams to make sure that the, the movies that are shown to you on the front page are ones that are relevant to you. Um, we have different services for the different devices, Android, iOS, Windows devices, they're all going to have different services that they talk to. Um, different storage services, so we've got, um, we use a lot of uh, Cassandra for application state. Uh, Hadoop for analytics, S3 for long-term storage, uh, EV cache, which is, you can think of it as like distributed memcache D. Um, so each of those have different services. Data pipeline, I mean, there's hundreds, so. Is there an intent to um, open source Flux, or is that like a completely internal tool? Or will that be something we can use at some point? So I wish uh, some of my engineers were here so that I could give them a hard time about that. The, the idea is that, uh, the, the general thinking right now is that the interface will be open sourced um, in some matter of quarters. Uh, the hard part is extracting the data to feed the interface. Uh, and that is entirely dependent on you know, the architecture that you have deployed. So that, that, uh, that interface, this one, um, this is WebGL based. We looked at a couple, you know, we looked at D3, um, I think it's called Pixel, P-I-X-L, and a couple other ones. Uh, we found that to get the, the visual effect that we wanted, we would have to go a little bit lower level. So this is a WebGL based and um, React and, you know, uh, other kind of typical JavaScript -y framework stuff. Uh, but then getting the uh, JSON data structure to it that informs this piece and the, and the other view, um, that would have to be platform dependent. So we can, uh, like in the open source version, we'll define what that uh, data tree looks like. And if you can provide that, then you'll be able to hook this into it. Cool, okay, lunchtime now. All right.